So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Hatif Vienna International Science School. Uh, it is already our 10th lecture and it's my very great pleasure uh, to introduce an old friend of mine, uh, Pavel Edinov, who is a professor of mathematics uh, at the Massachusetts Institute uh, of Technology. Uh, Pavel is an outstanding mathematician uh, he is uh, extremely collaborative, so he's written papers with over 100 mathematicians. Uh, his work is in representation theory and mathematical physics. And uh, uh, something I admire very much about Pavel, he's uh, also a bit of a role model for me, is that he's uh, founded or co-founded uh, a really, really exciting outreach program uh, uh, for gifted education. It's called uh, MIT Primes. So it's a way of uh, reaching out to support uh, high school students uh, also in making first research experiences. It's one of my favorite programs uh, out there. Uh, so today, Pavel is with us. And uh, uh, maybe let me also add uh, that Pavel is uh, hails from Kiev. Uh, so he, uh, uh, he's a graduate of the uh, Kiev Natural Science Museum uh, number 145, I believe. In the, yeah, before, before it was Lyceum, it was just a school, a math and science school before that. So did they make a name for themselves with you as their student? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so it's a school with an outstanding track record uh, for outstanding mathematicians. Uh, also Marina Vyatsovska, uh, uh, one of the most recent Fields medalists, uh, went to school there. Right. So Pavel, uh, you are going to teach us how to count, in fact, how to count colorings. Uh, the stage is yours and we all look very fo uh, forward very much to your special lecture. Thank you for being with us, Pavel. Okay, okay. thank you very much. It's my pleasure to give this lecture. And um, I want to, uh, at some point I will share my screen and we will uh, consider formulas and so on, but uh, I want to start with uh, showing things. So actually, uh, please pin my uh, video and uh, so that it is uh, large on your screen and I will show some things. Uh, so, uh, so we will uh, talk about problems like this. So suppose you have uh, some, uh, some objects such as, uh, for example, uh, regular icosahedron, uh, so the dodecahedron, I'm sorry, regular dodecahedron, and uh, uh, it has 12 faces. And uh, suppose we have uh, a certain number of colors. Uh, so in this case, uh, its faces uh, are colored in red, uh, yellow, uh, blue, and green. So there are four colors. And we want to count how many possible colorings there are. Or uh, we may be interested in, uh, in a problem like this. So for example, here in this, uh, there are three uh, faces of each color. Uh, so we might ask how many different colorings uh, we have so that uh, three faces are red, three faces are yellow, three faces are uh, blue, and three faces are green. Uh, and um, you might think uh, that this is, a, well, this is not a very difficult problem if you just uh, screw your uh, dodecahedron uh, to the table and don't allow to move it, then you can just, uh, uh, you know, take also like if you want to color, uh, let's say in four colors, you will just get four to the 12 colorings because uh, you will uh, be able to color every face in four different ways. But the trick is that it is not screwed to the table. We are allowed to turn it. And so some colorings that are initially different uh, might actually turn out to be the same after being turned, after, after this uh, uh, dodecahedron is, is turned. So for let's consider a simpler example. Uh, so here is a, a tetrahedron with four faces and uh, its faces are colored in uh, three colors. So two faces are yellow, uh, one face is green and one face is red. And here is another one, okay? So if I put them this way, they look different. So the face, for example, that's facing you is yellow in one case and uh, green in the other case. But, uh, but if I rotate it uh, and put it this way, then it will be the same. So they're indistinguishable as long as we're allowed 
to uh, 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 to turn them. In other words, uh, if uh, uh, if you uh, um, if you if you think about one of them, uh, and uh, and then uh, I put them behind my back and uh, and return them, I, you won't be able to tell which which one you thought about because they are indistinguishable as long as we are allowed to rotate them. And so what we want is to count coloring up to symmetries, up to rotational symmetries, for example, or up to any other kinds of symmetries. And so let's, uh, uh, so let's for example, uh, take the cube. So I have cube. Well, here it is also has four colors, uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's think about a simpler problem, how to color it in two colors. So let's, uh, for example, uh, think of red and yellow, uh, as one color and green and uh, blue as another color. So then uh, we see here this cube, there are four, let's say red faces and uh, uh, two uh, uh, blue faces. So we're gonna be a little bit color blind and we see only red and blue. So how many ways uh, to color uh, do we have? And actually, I want to make this a little bit interactive. So maybe uh, um, I, uh, I, you can turn on uh, uh, the microphone and, and, and answer. So how many colorings in uh, two uh, colors uh, do we have uh, if we uh, use two? faces which are blue and one which is uh, uh, yellow and, 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 and four which is uh, which is red. And so the answer is that two, as was uh, remarked in the chat, uh, so either blue faces are adjacent or are they across from each other, exactly. So there are up to symmetry, there are only uh, two such configurations. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's right. And so what about uh, three? So suppose we had three uh, faces which are blue and three faces which are uh, red. So how many ways will then, then uh, we will, uh, will we then have? So I'm looking at the chat. So three and three. So how many will we get? Still two, that's right. So blue faces can share a corner or two can be opposite, um, like in a tennis ball, exactly. Right, so that's uh, uh, how we can count. And uh, uh, so let me now share my screen. Uh, okay. All right, so here is uh, my screen. Uh, so, so uh, we just we're discussing count coloring cube, which has six faces with two colors, uh, and we saw that uh, uh, if we have two and four, there are two options. And uh, if uh, we have three and three, there are also two options and the same as four and two. And of course, uh, zero and six, there is one option and one and five, there is also one option. So we color, uh, let's say blue one face and then the rest of the faces are red up to symmetries, they are all the same. Uh, and, uh, and so also five one gives us one and six zero gives us one. And so if you want to have a total number of colorings, uh, then you obtain the sum of all those numbers, which is 10. So we see there are 10 total colorings of the cube in two colors. Now, what about three colors? Well, that's a little bit more complicated. So if you do it this, in this way directly, you need the good spatial imagination, or you may maybe want a model uh, to play with, and uh, you will get the answer if you count correctly, the answer is 57. Uh, and then you, you might ask what happens if you color or octahedron in two colors, octahedron in three colors, these problems you can solve. But, uh, but then if you go to, uh, 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 for, 
for example, even uh, so, so if you have, uh, uh, if you want to count the decahedron in two colors or three colors, that's going to be much more complicated because there are more symmetries, there are more uh, colors, there are more faces to color, and uh, you, you will uh, we, we, you will likely get confused. So it is not difficult. It, it, it is not easy to solve this problem in this elementary way. Uh, Yes, so, uh, and so what helps you here is the following theorem, which actually gives you the general answer. And we will discuss how one can uh, uh, obtain this theorem from some more general result, which is called polya enumeration theorem. So the theorem is the following. So the number of ways to color the faces of a dodecahedron in N colors, is the following polynomial in n. n of n equals to n to the 12 plus 15 plus 15 n to the 6 plus 44 n to the fourth divided by 60. So in particular, if you compute this polynomial, well, of course, if you just have one color, you just get one. So that's just a sanity check. But if you have uh, two colors, uh, you already get uh, 96. So this shows that it would be rather tricky to count this correctly. And then N of three is 9,099. This uh, means that it's kind of totally impossible for a human uh, to, in a reasonable amount of time to count these things correctly. Uh, okay, and so, uh, so now let me explain how uh, to obtain this formula. And for this reason, for this purpose, we will need group theory. But before that, are there any questions? All right, so let's proceed uh, then. So how do you obtain this formula? So we need group theory. So uh, suppose you have a, a finite set. So what is group theory? So suppose you have a finite set. For example, in our case, it will be faces of our polytope. Then you will have the set of all permutations of this set. So let's say the set is X, uh, and we will just uh, label its elements by numbers one through M. It's a finite set. So then this set is denoted by SM. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, uh, and, and we know that uh, this has M factorial elements, which are uh, permutations of one through M. Uh, and so uh, elements of the set uh, perm X will be denoted by such uh, tables, where on the top we will have numbers one, two, three, up to M. And in the bottom, we will have the same numbers, but in the order changed by the permutation. So in this way, we see what goes to what under this permutation. So the permutation is a mapping of the set to itself, uh, which, uh, which maps uh, one to two, two to four, three to one, and four to three. Uh, so, uh, well, the good thing about these permutations is that we can compose them. We can do one of them and then the other. And it matters actually in what order you do that. So uh, for example, take another permutation, which will be map one to three, two to four, three to one, and four to two. And then uh, we want to uh, compose them. So find the composition S composed with T. So this means that we will first do T and then do S because we apply it to something standing to the right of T. So first T acts and then S. So for example, suppose we start with one, well, with three, I'm sorry. So suppose we start with three. Uh, then under T, it goes to one. This is the blue arrow here. And then S sends one to two, which is the blue arrow here. So together the composition S composed with T sends three to two. So that's... Uh, the arrow here. And similarly, we can compute what happens to other things. Like for example, one goes to three under T 
and then three goes to one under S. So one goes to one and two goes to four under T and then four goes to three under S. So two goes to three and finally four goes to four. So the composition is this permutation, which is just a switch of two and three. Now we have the identity permutation, which is, uh, does nothing, it doesn't move anything. And also for every permutation, we have the inverse permutation, which uh, reverses uh, inverse permutation S inverse, which reverses S. And this is obtained by just uh, flipping the uh, rows and then ordering things uh, so that the top row is ordered in the increasing order. So, uh, so for example, uh, we had this S here, which sent one to two, two to four, three to one, and four to three. So S inverse should reverse it. So in particular, it should send one up to three here, and this is here, and it should send two up to one. So it's here, three up to four. So it's here and uh, four, up to two, so, so it's here. So that's the, the inverse permutation. And then the composition, the, the inverse permutation is uh, designed in such a way that it reverses S. So this means that if we uh, compose them in any order, S composed with S inverse and S inverse composed with S, we get the identity permutation. So it just undoes S. Uh, how, so in this case, the uh, composition uh, is independent on the order, but in general, if you, for example, take S, T, and T, S for this example, you will get different permutations. So uh, uh, composition of permutation, as they say, is not commutative. So it's not like multiplication of numbers or addition of numbers. The order of factors matters. And then the main definition that a subset, non-empty subset of term X, is uh, said to be a group if it is closed under composition, which means that if two elements belong to, uh, to G, then the composition belongs to G. If S and T belong to G, then the composition S composed to T belongs to G. Uh, and in particular, the entire set perm X is a group, which is called the symmetric group, and it's denoted by S. M. I think we agreed that the number of elements was M in X. Now, uh, normally uh, in, in a group, you also require that the identity element belongs to the group and that if some element S belongs to G, then S inverse belongs to G. But in the situation of finite sets, that's actually automatic. So this is a claim, it's actually an exercise. It's not difficult to show that if G is a subset of perm X, which is a group, which means an empty subset closed under composition, then identity element must be contained in G. And also if an element S is contained in G, then S inverse is contained in G. I will not prove it, but I can explain maybe after the lecture if there is a question, but this is a good exercise. This is true only for finite sets. For infinite sets X, you will have to you can still uh, make this definition, but then you have to impose these conditions independently. And another example, perhaps a trivial one, is when we take just the identity element, which we know must be there and nothing else, that's also a group, that's the so-called trivial group. So the biggest group is perm X and the smallest one is the identity. If we're talking about groups contained in perm X. So here is an example that's relevant to our accounting problems. Uh, let's think about uh, the uh, dodecahedron again. By the way, you should unpin uh, uh, my uh, picture so that you can see the formulas, but still there will be a picture in the corner of your screen where I'll show this thing. So the dodecahedron uh, uh, has 12 faces and we can think of those faces as a set of 12 elements. And then uh, symmetries of the dodecahedron will be uh, uh, a group inside of S12, uh, rotational symmetry. So it's a group of rotational symmetries of the dodecahedron. So it's not all elements because of course, 
if you have two faces that are opposite to each other, permutation cannot map them to faces which are adjacent to each other. Uh, it's actually very few. Turns out that this group has 60 elements, as we will see, uh, while uh, the S12 has 12 factorial elements, which is a very large number. So it's a very small part of S12, uh, the group of rotational symmetries of this dodecahedron. And, uh, and then uh, if you have any subgroup G in perm X, uh, then you can define this number N G of N, which is the number of colorings of X in N colors, which are inequivalent under G. So the number of equivalence classes, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I should say, uh, more precisely, this means that we're doing number of equivalence classes. So it's exactly the problem that we've been discussing. If we don't uh, quotient, uh, if we don't uh, take into account uh, this symmetry, then uh, we just get uh, uh, n to the number of elements in X, n to the m options, because uh, every element can be colored in n way. But if we do it up to symmetry, then roughly speaking, we have to divide by the order of G, but not quite. Because uh, if, uh, if we've only counted colorings that don't have any symmetries, uh, such, so, so that no rotation preserves the coloring, then indeed we would have to divide by the order of G. But this is not quite right, because there are some colorings that, that, that are highly symmetric. For example, if you color with one color, then all faces uh, will be colored, say yellow, and then any symmetry will preserve the color. And so here we don't need to divide by anything. And so that's what makes the problem tricky, that for some types of colorings, we have to divide by the order of G, for some types we have to divide by something smaller, for some types we don't have to divide by anything. And when things come together, you get something complicated. And that's exactly what is, uh, this is a kind of mess, that is um, sorted out by this remarkable theorem, which is called polya enumeration theorem. That's one of the most important theorems in um, enumerative combinatorics. And it says, gives a very simple formula for this number ng of n. It says that ng of n is equal to the following thing. So we take the sum. Uh, so, so maybe I forgot to mention here, I should have mentioned that the important feature of these permutations is that, they, is that they have cycle decomposition. So for example, uh, so we can keep uh, applying the permutation, we can keep composing it with itself and see what happens. So suppose, for example, we do S. So you start with one uh, and then it goes to two. Uh, and then what, what if we apply it to two, then it goes to four. And when applied to four, that goes to three, and three goes to one. So that means that we can write S as a single cycle, one, two, four, three. So one goes to two, two goes to four, four goes to three, and three goes back to one. And uh, in this, uh, we can also write it as two, four, three, one. So in this uh, parenthesis, we can always do a cyclic permutation of things. So it's a, just a single cycle. This permutation can be depicted this way by just a single cycle. So S is just this. As for T, it's different because T sends one to three, but then three to one. So there is a cycle closed. There's just a cycle of length two, one to three to one. And two goes to four and then to two. So that the picture for uh, T is going to have this form. Uh, so one, goes to three and two goes to four and then back to two. So this is the T. And we write it this way, one, three, two, four. So, uh, so there are two cycles of length two here and one cycle of length four here. And um, in this way, any permutation can be written uh, in, in, as a composition of independent cycles. Uh, and 
in a unique way. For example, if you use take the composition as composed with T, it is this permutation, and we see that one goes to one, two to three, three to two, and four to four. So there are actually three cycles here. There is a cycle uh, one, uh, uh, so uh, so one goes to itself, two goes to three back, and four goes to itself. So that's a permutation as composed with T. And the theorem of Polya uh, says that the number n g of n is just the following number. We sum over all elements of the group uh, of symmetries n to the number of cycles in this element. And we have to divide it by the order of g. So let's, uh, uh, let's see what we get for, for the dodecahedron. So for this purpose, we have to analyze uh, what happens uh, uh, with, uh, with the dodecahedron, what, what are the symmetries of the dodecahedron. So let's see how many symmetries uh, it has. So what kind of symmetries does the dodecahedron have? Well, uh, so, uh, so there is first of all uh, identity element, which does nothing. And then it has 12 cycles because there are 12 elements. Each of them is a cycle of length one. So that's trivial. But then more interestingly, uh, okay, so uh, there are uh, also uh, rotations around. So we have this axis that goes through midpoints of opposite uh, edges. And uh, we can rotate by 180 degrees. So there are as many of these elements as these axes. And so who can say how many do we get? How many axes do we have in the chat, please? So how, yeah, uh, okay, six, six. Okay, well, so let's count. So how many, uh, how many edges does the dodecahedron have? It has 12 faces. So each face is a pentagon. Right. So that's correct answer, 15 pairs of opposite edges because we have 12 faces, each face is a pentagon. And uh, so that means we have 60 edges, but each edge is counted twice this way because it belongs to two faces. So there are 30 edges. And therefore, there are for every edge there is an opposite edge, and so there are fifteen pairs of opposite edges and fifteen elements of this sort. So, and actually, uh, this is uh, item four here. So, fifteen rotation around these axes, and each of these rotations, what it does, it it's an order two rotation, so it's a uh, hundred and eighty degrees. So this means if we do it twice, we get the identity. So it has cycles of length two, and it doesn't have any fixed faces. There are no faces fixed by this map. So the 12 faces split into six pairs, uh, which, are, which are faces, so we, we, which are cycles. So in this case, we get six cycles. Now also, we have uh, rotations around axis uh, going through opposite vertices. And those rotations are by 120 degrees because three faces of the dodecahedron come together at the vertex. And uh, we know that there are 20 vertices of the icosahedron, the dodecahedron, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, so there are 10 uh, uh, pairs of opposite vertices. So 10 axes, uh, uh, and uh, um, and for each axis, we have rotation by 120 and by 240 degrees. So that means uh, that we have 20 elements. And there is a question in the chat, uh, are these generators of, of the symmetries or the list of all symmetries? This is the list of all symmetries. Uh, okay, so there are 20 symmetries of order three. And they again don't have any fixed uh, faces. They don't preserve any face. 
And they uh, split these 12 phases into cycles of length three. So there are four cycles of length three for those 20 elements. And finally, we have uh, rotations uh, around, uh, uh, phase, uh, around uh, axis that go through midpoints of opposite phases. Uh, and uh, we know that there are 12 phases, so there are six such axes. And also, uh, you can rotate by 2 pi over 5, by 4 pi over 5, by 6 pi over 5, and by 8 pi over 5. And so there are 24 such things. And then they do preserve some faces. So like those rotations preserve the faces which are intersected by the axis. So the two of the faces are preserved. They form cycles of length one. And also there are cycles of length five. So the 12 splits as one plus one plus five plus five. There are two cycles of length one and two cycles of length five. And so altogether there are four cycles. So this is summarized in this table here. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, identity elements with 12 cycles, 24 rotations by two pi, by, uh, by uh, uh, around axis going through phases. There are four cycles in each, then there are 20 rotations with four cycles in each again, uh, but of order three. And then there are rotations of order two with six cycles. And the order of the group, so if you add up all those numbers, you get 60. So one plus 24 is 25, plus 20 is 45, plus 15 is 60. And uh, so uh, therefore, uh, Polya's theorem gives us the number n of n uh, is uh, n to the 12. This is from the first kind plus 24 n to the fourth from the item two, plus 20 n to the fourth from item three, and plus 15 n to the sixth from item four. So together we get n to the 12th, plus 15 n to the sixth, plus 44 n to the fourth over 60. And by the way, you should, so that's the answer that I claimed before. Uh, and um, you should note that uh, in fact, uh, 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 it is not even obvious that this is a, an integer for every uh, integer n. It follows from our theorem uh, that, uh, that it's an integer because it counts colorings, but, uh, but it's not obvious if I just write down this polynomial, it has rational coefficients, which are not integers. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the coefficient of n to the fourth is uh, 44 over 60, which is uh, 11 over 15. And it is not clear why uh, this, this is an integer. So each summand, if, if I take each summand individually, it won't be an integer, only the sum is an integer. Any questions up to this point? Questions? Okay, so then uh, let me uh, explain, um, give you another example of counting. So let's count necklaces. So we have a uh, necklace is a, a, a bunch of beads put on a circle. Uh, and uh, suppose we have P beads and N colors. And how many uh, are there up to rotation? And let's say these beads are one-sided. So we color them only on one side. So that means we are not allowed to rotate the necklace like this, only rotate the necklace uh, like you rotate the wheel of the car. Uh, well, in this case, the, what are the group of symmetries? Uh, so in this case, uh, this is just the group of rotations by uh, 360 degrees over P times K. So two pi K over P in radians. Uh, and so the order of this group is P. We can ro rotate by one piece of the circle, by two pieces of the circle, by three pieces of the circle and so on. So that's a cyclic group of order P, so-called. Uh, let's assume for simplicity that P is a prime. You can do the counting in general, but the simplest count you obtain if P is a prime. For example, P is 101. Uh, then all elements of this group, except the identity, have just one cycle, right? 
because if you have a prime and uh, um, so you rotate, uh, uh, you can all orbits are going to have the same size. And, and uh, if uh, you have a prime, uh, this will mean that there is just one orbit of length P. And so therefore we have a very simple count. So we have the identity element that contributes N to the P into poly R enumeration theorem. And then uh, there are uh, P minus one elements, which are cyclic uh, rotations. And uh, they all have just one cycle. So we just get N and P minus one times. So we get N to the P plus P minus one times N divided by P, which can be written as follows. It's N plus N to the P minus N divided by P. And by the way, note that from this follows Fermat's little theorem, which says that this number is an integer, n to the p minus n over p. For example, suppose we want necklaces with seven beads and two colors, then the answer is two to the seventh plus six times two over seven, which is 140 over seven, which is 20. So there are 20 colorings of this necklace. Any questions? Okay, and so now I want to talk about the weighted version of this theorem. Uh, well, I, I told you that sometimes we want to count not all colorings, but we want to count colorings with a certain number of <laughs> faces colored by each color. Like for example, we might want to color the regular dodecahedron like this with three, uh, uh, color, uh, three faces of each of the four colors. Like I, this is re really a, a, like a set of uh, plastic uh, uh, faces out of which I can make this uh, dodecahedron. So that would be the number of ways to make it out of those faces. Because I only have three faces of each color. And uh, this is uh, uh, okay, fr prime factorization of uh, N affecting. Uh, Necklace counting is not obvious. It's a it's a question. There, we did not we did not use prime factorization of n. So so actually uh, actually this is the whole point. So the, there is no uh, we get that Fermat's little theorem is viewed usually as a result in number theory, but in fact we obtained a purely combinatorial proof of this theorem. So we proved that p divides n to the p minus n. But we didn't use any number theory. We only used combinatorics. We used we showed that it was an integer by showing that it counts something. So that's a curious thing about this thing. Okay, and so now I want to uh, talk about the uh, um, weighted version, which will allow us to do what I just said. So so this means that we are going to prescribe how many faces will be colored by each color. And in this case, we all of a sudden get a lot of data in the, in the game, so a lot of numbers. And to keep track, so so suppose we have n colors, and and to keep track of all this data, it's actually convenient to use generating functions. So many of you have heard about the role of generating function in combinatorics. So uh, instead of having a table of number, you write a generating function, which is basically a polynomial whose coefficients are those numbers or is power series, but in our case, it will be just polynomial. And so to keep track of things, uh, we will introduce variables t, t1 through tn for every color. So t1 for the first color, t2 for the second color, and so on. And then we can define this number, which I'm going to call n sub g of k1 through kn. So in the same situation where you have a set x and you want to look at colorings up to symmetries by group g, of perm x in perm x. And so this is the number of colorings of x in n colors so that for every color i, exactly ki elements are colored with this, with this color. So 
So, uh, and of course, in this case, we need to have a balance, which means that the sum of all these ki's have to be exactly the order, the number of elements in x, which is uh, which is the number n for us. And here is a weighted version of poly I enumeration theorem, which is a stronger version. And it says the following, that if you write the generating function for these numbers, sum over K1 through Kn, over all possible values, and G of K1, Kn times T1 to the K1, Tn to the Kn. So it's a certain polynomial. That's actually given by this explicit formula, which is one over the order of the group, G, times the sum over all elements of the group. And for each element, you form the following product. You take for all numbers R, you take the polynomial T1 to the R plus T2 to the R plus so on plus Tn to the R. And then you raise that to the power CR of G, which is the number of cycles of length R. So, so, so we have a number of cycles Overall, C of G is C1 of G plus C2 of G plus C3 of G plus so on. And uh, so, uh, so you have this polynomial and, and then, uh, so this answer is pretty explicit. So you can compute this polynomial and then you can foil open the brackets um, and uh, collect terms. And that will, uh, and then you can extract the coefficients, and those coefficients will be exactly the numbers you are interested. In. So these are the numbers. And now, well, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, note that the previous theorem, uh, which was the unweighted version, is a special case of this. When uh, you specialize, you take all these ti's to be one. So if you take all the ti's to be one, on the left-hand side, you will just be taking the sum of all the numbers ng of k1 through kn. So this means that you will count all the colorings. And on the right side, you will get uh, uh, n. So this sum t1 to the r plus t2 to the r plus tn to the r for every r will be just n. And so you will get n to the cr of g product over r. So this will be, uh, just n to the sum of all CR of Gs, which is exactly n to the C of G. And that's exactly the formula that we had in the unweighted uh, version of the theorem, which is this. So the weighted version is a more refined version of the theorem. And also, uh, uh, I want to give an example how to use that for the dodecahedron. So let's count the colorings of the phases of the regular dodecahedron uh, in two colors. Well, here are four colors. It's a bit too complicated, so let's do two colors. Uh, well, according to this weighted poly I enumeration theorem, uh, this uh, is counted by some polynomial P of T1, T2. And in fact, uh, we will uh, take the first variable to be T and the second one to be one. Because it's a homogeneous polynomial, this is uh, sufficient. So we compute this polynomial. And so remember, how do we compute it? We divide by the order. So it's 1 60th. And then we have to uh, uh, compute this thing for all the elements. Well, for the identity element, it only has one cycles. So the only r equals one term will be present here. So it's going to be t plus 1 to the number of cycles, which is t plus 1 to the 12. Now. The next term is uh, those uh, rotations around faces, uh, er, around uh, lines through uh, midpoints of ed opposite edges. These are order two rotations, and they have six cycles of length two. So we have t squared plus one, which is t, t, t one squared plus t two squared to t squared plus one to the six. Then um, for, uh, there are 20 elements of order three, they had four cycles of length three and no others. So we get 20 times T cubed plus one to the fourth. And finally, the elements of order five, where, which we uh, 
uh, which are rotations uh, around axis through midpoints of faces, uh, those had two types of cycles. They had two cycles of length one, which are faces that they fix, and two cycles of length five. Uh, and so uh, we will get t plus one squared times t to the fifth plus one squared, and there are 24 of them. So we get this uh, polynomial. Uh, and then you can uh, open parentheses and compute this polynomial. It's not very hard. And you get the following polynomial here. And uh, then you can read off the coefficients. So for example, if you want to color the dodecahedron uh, into two colors so that you have six faces of each color, then you need to look at the coefficient of t to the six, and that would be 24. And if you, for example, wanted to color it so that there are five faces of one color and seven faces of another color, you read the coefficient to t to the uh, five or t to the seventh, the, the same, because this is a palindromic polynomial, and you will get 14. So any questions about this? All right, so uh, maybe uh, I should uh, I should stop and allow uh, for questions and also uh, talking about things other than this lecture. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Pavel. Uh, it's amazing, and I uh, I've learned a lot from your from your talk. Uh, questions from I don't me? I don't believe this. <laughs> no, no, I no no. no. <laughs> You're teaching me how to count, so counting is not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, any questions from the audience? So hold on, there are another three slides. Is that right, Pavel? Yeah, yeah. There is a there is a proof of this uh, theorem of the unweighted version, which I uh, didn't uh, explain because maybe it is uh, it requires uh, some uh, background. Uh, very small background in group theory. So I can repeat it on request. I, I, I can explain it on request. Maybe as a cultural experience for the students later. Uh, and, and I would like to see. Uh, oh. Maybe, Pavel, what are good examples to practice? Maybe you can give us some practice problems. Um, yeah, yeah. So there were pro problems here. So for, for example, uh, uh, coloring octahedron in two colors and in three colors, dodecahedron, in, uh, we already uh, computed. Uh, you know, various uh, kinds of, uh, uh, so you, uh, you, you can count uh, like all, uh, uh, like icosahedron in, in two colors, uh, you know, computing this polynomial and so on. So, so there are many, many exercises like that. So icosahedron, icosahedron in two colors, that sounds uh, like a good place to start for the students. Yes, 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 absolutely. It's not so hard to understand. Yes. So the symmetry group of icosahedron is fact the same as dodecahedron because they are what is called Poincaré dual, which means that if you take midpoints of faces of dodecahedron and connect them, you will get icosahedron and vice versa. So they have the same symmetry group. So you just have to see how symmetry acts on a different set. So you could actually do the same thing. So coloring faces of icosahedron is equivalent to coloring vertices of dodecahedron. And so you can just uh, do this will be a different sound because the, the same group acts in a different set. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <laughs> um, so there's a, a, a question from Nastya. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, when we count in the symmetry lines, how do we understand that there is no symmetry lines which we didn't count? So ah, well, I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, so, uh, so if we look at the at the dodecahedron, uh, yeah. So you have to you have to prove that indeed that there are no other symmetries. Uh, but uh, uh, so this is uh, yeah. So so you you have to check it. It's pretty geometrically obvious that the only symmetries of the dodecahedron are symmetries uh, like that because rotational symmetries. So you have to use the following the theorem that every rotation in three dimensions is a rotation around some axis by some angle. And in order for it to be a symmetry, the axis has to go either through the midpoint of a face or midpoint of an edge or a vertex. 
And uh, so, so from that, it's easy to see that, in fact, these are the only symmetries. Because if it doesn't go, yes, it's a theorem of Euler that every rotation is rotation around an, an axis uh, 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 by some angle in three okay, dimensions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where are you going, Nastya? Uh, so, oh, excuse me? Uh, I'm going to like back to UK because I was in Czech uh, Republic for some time visiting my uncle. Yeah. And now you're going back to the UK? Yes, back to the United Kingdom. And Nastya, you're from Kharkiv originally? Yes, originally I am from Kharkiv. And due to war, we needed to, uh, to go somewhere. So we choose the United Kingdom to practice English. It's very good to have you, Nastya. Um, are there any... So there is a question in the chat I will answer. Could you use uh, the theorem to count the number of uh, simple graphs? Yeah, you can use uh, the theorem for counting various things like colored graphs and so on. But, uh, but in general, you know, it, it it depends on how complicated your group is, and and so then uh, you might get a formula which is not very simple. But yes, graph counting problems are solved by similar techniques. Constantina. Yeah. Um. Another question is: so we considered uh, counting colorings for three D objects, and what if we considered colorings in other dimensions? So, for example, um. In the second dimension, uh, we have a square and we would color its edges. Uh, so something similar to the beads and any rotate, uh, we could do a rotation like 90, 180 and 270, but uh, reflecting it is we can't do because um, it's a rotation out of its plane. And so- Yeah, what you're asking about consider... higher dimensions. Yeah, higher dimensions. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You can do the same for higher dimensional polytopes. And um, um, by the way, regarding graphs, maybe I should explain. That's a very good question. So how do you how do you adjust this to graphs? So what is a simple graph? Simple graph means that you have a bunch of points and points which are vertices of this graph, and then uh, you either can for every two points you either connect them with an edge or you don't connect, right? But this can be thought of the following that. Uh, you take the complete graph where you uh, connected all, uh, for, you know, drew all possible edges, and then you color its edges in uh, black and white. And if it is white, that means you erase the edge. If it's black, that means you keep the edge. So the uh, so so in that uh, so you, yeah, and so the, if you apply the theorem. Uh, you will get a number uh, formula for the number of graphs. It won't be a particularly simple formula, but it will be a, a formula. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, Pavel, I think, Constantine, you are from Kiev, right? Yes. Yeah? No. Uh, uh, no. Constantine, no. we know, yeah, I know him because he is in the problem, program Julia's Dream. Ah, very cool. <laughs> so, Constantine, you might have had a head start. <laughs> Uh, Pavel, I think I'm ready ready for another page. Okay, so let, 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 gently, let me explain. Very so, gently. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I want to prove this formula here, the poly uh, uh, theorem for uh, unweighted version, which uh, uh, which is uh, the formula uh, right here uh, in blue. Uh, so uh, one over the order of g times the sum of n to the c of g. And for this purpose, okay, we will need uh, uh, some little bit more group theory. So I will denote by x n the number, uh, the set of colorings of x in n colors. So that's a set now, and I need to count how many elements in this set uh, modular action of the group. So this means I have to count orbits of g on x n. So, uh, so this means uh, the following. So here is our set. Maybe I drew a picture, draw a picture. So this is our set Xn. So schematically denote by points, the possible colorings. And now permutations from G 
they change one coloring into another. Like I explained that, uh, like if you rotate, like for example, you have this coloring and then you rotate and you get this one. And so it acts on them. And what it does, it's some of the colorings are equivalent and some aren't. So what you get is, for example, it can you can go from here to here and from here to here, and maybe from here to here. And in this way, they split in the so-called orbits, which are colorings that can be obtained from each other by the action of this permutation group. So this means that they're equivalent. And what we need to count is not the number of elements in Xn per se, but we need to count the number of orbits, which is elements up to this action. And they are called orbits Y because, for example, we have the group of, in the infinite case, we have the group of rotations of the plane uh, uh, around the uh, origin. And uh, if you look at orbits, orbit of a point is determined by the distance from this point to the center. Any two points, which have the same distance to the center are equivalent. And uh, orbits look like circles. And so they look like orbits of planets. And that's why they are called orbits. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so we need to count those orbits. But instead of counting orbits, uh, we will count the following objects, which actually turns out to be equivalent to counting orbits. We will count pairs G comma C, where C is a coloring and G is a permutation that preserves this color. So it's an element of our group that preserves this color. Then there is a thing, theorem in the group theory, which is called the orbit stabilizer theorem. This is not the difficult theorem, but I don't have time to explain it. And it says that it, it tells you how many elements are there in the orbit of uh, of C. So this orbit like has three elements, for example, here, and this orbit has one element and this orbit has two elements. And it tells you that the number of elements in the orbit is the quotient of the order of G, number of elements in the group G by the number of elements in this GC, which is called stabilizer. It is the elements that preserve this coloring. So it turns out that the denominator divides the numerator here. So this is an integer. And moreover, it is the number of elements in the world. So this I have to use as a black box because I didn't have time, don't have time to explain the proof, but it's not difficult. And then, uh, so this means that every, so, so how many times will each element of, uh, of the orbit appear uh, in, in this count? Well. Uh, it will appear, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, right. So it will appear order of GC times because uh, uh, I can multiply the element G by, uh, well, well, because every C comes with, with, with an element G in this group. So it will appear this many times. Uh, and orbit has this many elements. So it's each element of the orbit appears this many times. So orbit itself uh, will appear. Well, I mean, or elements of a given orbit will appear how many times? The product of this with this, which is just the order of G. And this is great because it doesn't depend on anything. So this means that if we count these pairs, we will get this correct answer, NG of N, except that we only have to divide by the order of G. And now, how do we actually count these pairs? So actually counting these pairs will produce the formula. Well, we will count them as follows. We will just count for every element of the group. We will count all the possible C's that we can get. And the C's that we can get are exactly those C's which are symmetrical under this element. So this means, that the coloring should be symmetric under a particular element. So for example, if it's a order three rotation around the axis going through the vertices, this would mean that colors on those all three faces are the same. Colors on every cycle are the same because the cycle is elements that go through to each other under this transformation. And so what we will get is that we, we color now not individual faces, but we color entire cycles. And so we will get n to the number of cycles. 
it is the number of colorings invariant under this element. And so that means uh, that uh, we obtain uh, these numbers n to the c of g, and then we have to sum them over all group elements. And we have to divide, remember at the end, we have to divide by the order. So we will get this formula, which is exactly what the theorem is saying. That's, that's basically the summary of how this is done. And I assume that um, 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 uh, the version for uh, more than one color is only slightly more difficult. Uh, that, that's right. And the, the, uh, <laughs> for the, the weighted version is done in the same way, except that instead of this n to the c of g, there will be this polynomial, because that's, uh, uh, you, you have to show that uh, counting uh, colorings invariant with respect to this element g, if you restrict the number of faces, is given by this polynomial. It is slightly more difficult, but not too much. And the idea is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe we can leave that as an exercise to uh, uh, the students. Yes, yes. Uh, so I'm checking. This is maybe not a proof from the book. Uh, do you know, is this in Günther's uh, textbook? Point yeah. formula? Well, I mean, all proofs are uh, basically, uh, you, you know, it could be written in a different language. I think this is the kind of... Uh, basically, all proofs are going to be equivalent if you think about them carefully. Yeah, but uh, I think it's very beautiful. So when I learned about this theorem in my first algebra class, when I was um, a, a first year student, I I was and um, I, I loved it very much, and I loved your presentation very much. Uh, so <laughs> everyone, let's uh, thank the speaker, uh, uh, Pavel. It was uh, wonderful, and we now. Uh, turn to the uh, part of uh, the special lecture that we are freestyling. Uh, students, Pave is an incredible mathematician and he's a very uh, colorful person uh, and he's here to answer any and all of your questions. He's yeah, by the way, there is a question in the chat which I uh, want to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, so Richard Stanley's book on algebraic combinatorics, uh, one of my favorite books, Aras uh, Ashir, is Richard Stanley's book on algebraic combinatorics. What are some books online resources to recommend to go deep, deep, deeper into some of the topics covered here? For example, more spectral theory and young tableau. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Stanley's book on algebraic combinatorics is a great source for this type of material. But also algebra, you know, group theory. Uh, for example, uh, there is a nice book by Mark, Mike Arten, which is called Algebra. Uh, which uh, contains this type of things uh, and uh, stuff about group theory. And uh, if you want to just, uh, uh, so I, I have a, a lex some lectures that I gave for high school students, which is called Groups Around Us. So you can find uh, them online and uh, they contain this material and many, a lot more. Um, so Mike Artin is uh, a colleague of yours. Uh, it, uh, That's in, right. And uh, he's was, now reti retired, but he uh, is a professor emeritus at MIT. So uh, it's kind of hard to imagine someone like Mike Artin to retire. His uh, father is uh, Habsburg-born, uh, so he yes. started at the University of Vienna. Um, uh, Pavel, what are your favorite books of all times uh, about mathematics? Yes, there is a, Dimitro is asking question, is there here anyone? There are several people here who participated in this program, uh, more than one. I already see several. <laughs> maybe maybe you can uh, uh, like Dimitro's uh, comment if you've participated in Julia's streams um, uh, or MIT Primes, uh, so we can have a count on you. <laughs> yeah, so probably there are you know, like at least three or four people, probably, if not more. Anyway, uh, yeah, so can you uh, can you repeat your So the question is, can you repeat your question? I'm sorry, I got distracted. So my question, one of my favorite questions is, uh, what what is your favorite book? Uh, what is a book that you that you really liked reading when you were an undergrad, for example? What gave you ideas about mathematics? 
actually, uh, I, I, I like, uh, so on the Prime's website, mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a link which is called Reading List, mm -hmm. which is some of the books that we've been using for high school students. And they contain books that I liked uh, as a uh, high school student and uh, undergrad. Uh, there is a book uh, which is called uh, uh, Abel's Theorem in Problems and Solutions by mm -hmm. Alexey, and it's translated into English. Moreover, it's available freely online, and it's uh, the link to that book is contained, is in, uh, uh, is on this reading list in Primes. And, uh, and so, uh, right, this is the book. And uh, it's, uh, it's very nice because what it does, it uh, does from scratch, uh, uh, proves the uh, Abel theorem about impossibility of solving fifth order equation in radicals. Uh, and in particular, it uh, uh, starts with group theory. So all this stuff about, well, it wouldn't have this theorem there, but the stuff like orbit stabilizer and so on, that, that will probably be there. And uh, and nice thing about this book is that it is built as there is no theory there. You, you just uh, build the theory yourself by solving a sequence of problems. And this is what I liked a lot. Um, did you read it as a student? Yes, oh. I did. In fact, uh, and uh, well, not it wasn't assigned. I just read it by myself. And this was, uh, I like books which are built in this way, as a sequence of problems. There are very few, but uh, this is one of them. You know, when I was uh, a postdoc at MIT, my problem sets were rumored to be the longest in the history of the department. Ah, yes. Barely yes. under 15 uh, pages. <laughs> yeah, so so I actually, I taught the class Math 55 at Harvard, which is this uh, class, fam class famous for being very difficult. Uh, so it's a, like analysis and linear algebra uh, and al abstract algebra for first year, but for the most advanced students. Mm -hmm. And uh, so two people from that class are my colleagues at MIT now, professors. Uh, in the math department, wow. but anyway, so uh, uh, I, I would give very long problem sets as well, and and then I uh, one day I didn't give one and um, uh, gave them a break, and then I told them a joke about a man who is uh, sitting and hitting his finger with a hammer, and uh, another. Did they, did they um, think it was funny? <laughs> hitting with a hammer, his finger. It's like it, it's hilarious <laughs> right and so he someone asked why why are you doing that he says i'm i'm enjoying myself well how can you enjoy this this must be very painful i enjoy myself when i miss <laughs> okay um okay um okay so who are these colleagues I wonder. Oh, Davesh Malik uh, was there. Uh, he's an algebraic geometer. And uh, John uh, uh, Kellner uh, uh, is a theoretical computer science, uh, you know, discrete math. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any more students, uh, any more questions uh, from the audience? Don't be shy. Nastya. Yes. I have one more question. What is the amplitude you're using for this note? Uh, what is the, the oh, oh, the notes uh, on group theory, groups around us. Is that what you were asking? Uh, the app where you made this like presentation. Oh, this presentation. I will, uh, I will yeah. send um, uh, Michael this presentation. Mm -hmm. okay. So it turns out Pavel is one of very few people in the world who are allowed to call me Michael. To ah. everyone else, it's Michael. <laughs> ah, Michael, okay, <laughs> yes. Michael. Be very careful what you do with your name when you're moving abroad. I see yes, yes. your name is your name is your name. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hold on to it. Um, so maybe it's uh, time to uh, call it a special lecture uh, for the general audience. And uh, maybe the Ukrainian students uh, can stay behind and Pavel can stay behind um, and uh, you, can, you can chat a little bit. 
um, uh, seeing that you that you have a lot of things in common. So uh, um, thanks everyone for for listening in. Thanks again, Pave. I love your talks. Um, <laughs> Uh, and maybe only maybe I'm going to hit myself with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so should I? Should, so should should I go or uh, can no, I? No, you no, you stay. <laughs> ah, yes. okay. You are you are kind of in the middle of this. <laughs> ah yes. Okay. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, everyone again uh, in tomorrow's lecture by Günther, Günther Ziegler. Günther, also an amazing mathematician and a very close friend of mine. Uh, and uh, he will give a fantastic talk. So bye everyone now. And uh, we will move to the Ukrainian uh, part of uh, 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 the evening or morning <laughs> in Pavel's case. Okay. Nito, will you stop the recording?